Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 11 of the Showbound podcast presented by Axel Watches. I'm your host, Michael Raskin, once again, joined by Ethan Cardwell, live from Sweden. Cardsy, how's it going? Doing good, man. Uh, just hanging in there. I was just watching the, uh, the Sandbagger Invitational that's been in Chicklets Runs with the boys here, just trying to kill some time before practice. Uh, but no, it was a sunny day here in Sweden, which we don't see often. So good day so far, and uh, just going to keep it rolling. How about yourself? Uh, yeah, nothing new over here. I mean, Ontario lockdown, hanging at home, but um, <laughs> we'll we'll get into more Sweden stuff in a second. But I, I do want to say that as people are listening to this podcast, the NHL has begun. So an exciting week as this comes out on Wednesday, first day of the NHL season. So um, I was catching some of the scrimmages uh, that the that were basically the NHL preseason this year, like the Leafs blue versus white game. And I, I actually checked out the Philadelphia one. Um, their their game because uh, your teammate Tyson Forrester was playing there and it was good seeing him have you caught any of that stuff I guess you know with the time difference it's probably pretty tough for you yeah no it's been super tough to watch like really anything like let alone even trying to like set up the calls and with you and stuff I know it's morning there and uh, getting close to uh, dinner time here but uh, no I haven't been able to watch much but uh, hopefully when the NHL starts maybe I'll be able to catch some afternoon games if we get any of those yeah, that'd be nice, and we can definitely talk about it. But uh, we got a big episode this week. Not only is hockey returning, but we got Ty Delandria on the podcast. Delhi's a first-round pick of the Dallas Stars, World Junior Gold Medalist in 2020 with Team Canada. He was with the Dallas Stars in the NHL bubble last uh, playoffs, and he's currently at the Stars camp, which is under a COVID pause right now. And he's looking like he has a good chance to make the team this year. So. Uh, Cardsy, I know he's one of your buddies. You you got anything to say about Delhi? Just a great interview we had. Yeah, it was an awesome interview. Really good to get him on. And he, he's a beauty, like one of the nicest guys I know in the game anyway. And uh, yeah, I have nothing but good things to say about him. And uh, he's well-spoken. So I think uh, the listeners are really going to enjoy this one. Yeah, it was it was great to, to chat with him. And he had a lot of good insight too. Uh, let's talk about Sweden. I know you got the first game under your belt. I'll just say it. You got a point. So that's out of the way. <laughs> professional hockey player now with a with a professional point so uh like tell us what you've been up to how the game went and, and just all about it yeah dude uh it's a lot different right so the bit with the big ice and stuff there's not a lot of like like Delhi mentions later on in the interview there's not a lot of run and gun really it's a lot of curl back with the puck and teams are setting up traps and stuff so you got to kind of create your own offense in in a sense but uh I'm just trying to use my speed and make opportunities for myself and uh, hopefully good things will come from doing that. But no, it was a, it was a good first game. Fun to get back out there. It's been 10 months since I played. So a little bit rusty. It wasn't my greatest game, but uh, yeah, like you mentioned, was able to salvage a point. It was actually cool. Murr got the goal and uh, both me and Jack uh, Thompson assisted on it. So it was, oh, it was nice. pretty sick. For, for a shift too. So no get the way. Shift. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get, we, uh, didn't have to wait too long. And I know we were talking about that uh, on last week's episode. So yeah, the boys are uh, having a good time here and uh, the, our teammates have been great with us and uh, making us feel welcome in the room. So it's been an easy transition. That's so exciting, man. Good for you and good for both, uh, both JT and Murr there. But um, you, you know, you talk about that curl back the trap game and, and I think that might even suit you. Cause even in, in Barry last year, you, I don't know if this is a, a good comparison, but Matt Barzal kind of comes to mind when I think of your play style in the sense where he he's curling back, waiting to make the play. I mean, he does it a lot, mm -hmm. but you, you know, I see you kind of spinning back in the D zone and making space for yourself. And I think with a lot more open ice, that might be good for you, especially in a trap style, to be honest. Like, do you find that it, it suits your game well there? Yeah, man. Like I love it. And I know it's kind of like sometimes even frowned upon in the O when I'd, I'd get the puck on the half wall as a right winger and I'd curl back in our own zone and try to take the puck up ice and just kind of charge forward with sp some speed. But I, I love doing it. And I think being a good skater and uh, just, it allows you to have more deception, screw with other teams, gaps, catch them flat footed. And, and just all that uh, equals up to success on the offensive side of the puck, in my opinion. And it goes back to me being a defenseman as a kid, I was always going up from the, from the back end of the ice off forward. So uh, just kind of fundamentals like that, just kind of carrying over and being uh, crucial here. Yeah. I mean, it's just even as simple as making more space for yourself by bringing it back. Mm -hmm. Like there, there's a lot. And I think, uh, it's funny, the listeners will hear later in the interview, but Delhi talks about uh, the five-man trap that was going on in the Finnish league while he was playing there. And I was, I was telling my buddies about it last night. It, 
you, you don't even think about something like that in North America. So um, it's definitely eye-opening kind of hearing these stories from other leagues and even I'm excited to keep talking to you about it and um, I know you have a couple games coming up this week so uh, that'll be good have you been up to anything off the ice anything uh, you know touring the cities or, or doing anything like that yeah actually I'll I'll go back to the five-man trap actually it's funny we practice it in practice but like uh, so it's me Mur, and uh, a younger guy on our team uh, so we, we got a lot of speed on our line and uh, our coach doesn't speak amazing uh, English, but he manages. So he came over and we're, we're talking about the trap. He's like, you guys just don't do the trap. Like you, you're too fast. Just don't bother with the trap. But uh, no, the rest of our team, like we really emphasize like working on that five man trap and kind of making teams really have nothing, no entry plays. So, but yeah, no, we've been, uh, we got to go into the city a few times now. There's a fi- city like 15 minutes out gonna butcher the name probably vastress or uh it it starts with a v ends with an s vastress um but uh no we're, we're 15 minutes away from there so we'll go in uh the odd time with the boys have dinner there or something like that uh so it's a nice city there not much going on in our town so we'll go on walks and stuff like that just to get some fresh air but uh i'm sure uh sure we'll get into the city at some point here soon again and uh we'll be able to tour down by the water and the beach and stuff. So it should be pretty good. Awesome. And uh, let, let's talk about some NHL news. As you're listening to this, the season has, has started. It's Tuesday as we record. So we got one more day um, off the ice. Henrik Lundqvist has had successful open heart surgery and he's recovering. Uh, we talked about it last week and um, we'll keep everybody updated as it goes, but that's just amazing news. Obviously uh, pretty, pretty terrifying thing going on there, but everybody's so happy to see him. Um, be okay and hopefully recover and who knows i mean he's he's got his heart set on a return to the nhl which would be spectacular so any thoughts on that cards yeah dude um i know we've been tracking this for a few weeks now and uh pretty tragic to hear at first what was going on but uh really awesome to hear he's bouncing back and a guy like him he's been great for the game over the years so really looking forward to seeing him have a speedy recovery and uh hopefully his wish does come true and he can make it back to the nhl at some point here and on the topic of NHL goalies, Corey Crawford has announced his retirement just before this season. A little bit of an unusual timing. I mean, you don't usually hear people retire heading into camp, but I think, you know, with the with the COVID season and him, maybe he was thinking this might be his last one. And just with all that's going on now, it seems like an easier decision uh, if he doesn't want to, you know, risk his health or his family's health. So obviously a legend, multiple Stanley Cups. And, and uh, what do you think about that one? Yeah, he's done a lot for Chicago over the years. Um, and, yeah, it's going to be sad to see him leave the game. He's been uh, such a big influence. And uh, I know a bunch of goalies would look up to him as a super big role model. And I know uh, the Chicago Blackhawks did a little tribute video during their scrimmage the other day. So that was pretty cool to see that and uh, how much every, everyone cares for him. And uh, I've heard he's just a great locker room guy and uh, a good glue guy. And obviously just with that culture they have in Chicago of winning, he was a huge part of that. So it'll be sad to see him uh, leave the game, but uh, just want to wish him the best and say congrats on an amazing career. I'll put you on the spot here cards, but with, with Crawford retiring and um, a subpar season for Chicago last year, do you think it's really time to to start the rebuild now? Do you see maybe Taze or Kane or at some point any any one of those guys getting traded? That's a tough question. I think I think they have it in them to keep pushing, but who knows, right? They could get a lot for one of those guys if they if they made a deal, um, Taves and Kane especially. Um, so yeah, that, that's a really tough question. It, it'd be a huge front office move if they did uh, if they did move somebody, but it could pay dividends down the road as uh, so it could rebuild that franchise and get them some more Stanley Cups. But who knows? We'll see. Uh, but yeah, that, that's a good question. That that could be a potential possibility coming up in the uh, upcoming years for sure. Yeah, I mean, if if they miss the playoffs this year and maybe even next year, like do you, I don't know if if. Kane or Taze is going to be like, look, I want to stick around for this rebuild. Like they're in the late getting towards the later stages in their career. They might say, put me on a winning team. And and I don't know. I mean, it's, it's definitely a possibility, but uh, an interesting one. I don't know if you saw this. I had my friend send it to me, but PK Subban and Miles Wood got in a fight during the devil's scrimmage. Did you catch that? Yeah, I actually saw that till it was pretty heated, man. It doesn't, I don't think Subban dropped his gloves, but they, they were pretty heated going off the ice. And I think there was one at uh, Canucks camp too. So the boys are battling hard. It's been away from hockey for a little bit now. So it's good to see the intensity uh, 
it's high. So looking forward to seeing some games and uh, see what they can bring to the table there. Yeah, oh, that, we'll leave it at that. That's a good spin on it. <laughs> Actually, I was, man, I, I just got a notification on my phone. So the Bruins are to retire Willie O'Ree's number 22 on February 18th, the first black player in NHL his, or in NHL in the history yeah. of the NHL. So he'll be uh, the Bruins' 12th uh, honoree of uh, name and thereafter. So that's pretty cool and pretty special to uh, to the equality movement that's going on in the world right now. So it's really good to see that. Yeah, I mean, Willie O'Ree is a legend. I'm actually surprised his number isn't retired. Uh, you know, they have the NHL Willie O'Ree Award that they give out at the awards every year and um, obviously an inspiration to every every player. So that that's pretty exciting. That's good news, good timing too, that it just pops up on your phone. But yeah, um, so there you go. That That's exciting. And then, um, you know, as I kind of mentioned before, there's some COVID issues in the NHL right now that are delaying some NHL camps. And uh, I think it's something we'll see as the season goes on, kind of like the NBA and the NFL dealt with where, you know, you just miss a few games and, and reschedule later on. But um, unfortunately it, it probably will keep happening and hopefully uh, it doesn't, you know, harm anybody's health or, or, or cause any further issues other than delaying games. But um, other than that, the season's ready to go and, and I can't wait to watch hockey and um, it'll be interesting to see who's, making these teams cards because they have you know the taxi squad now where they can carry some extra guys and um obviously a lot of friends of ours are kind of like fringe players right now and uh it'll be interesting to see if they're, they're getting games in and um do you have any thoughts on on stuff like that yeah i've been keeping in touch with a lot of boys at camps right now and uh they're just excited to be there um i know we're going to talk about it with delhi later on with dallas's struggles with covid and whatnot uh, throughout their franchise so they're going to get pushed back in their games and as you said it, it will be an ongoing problem but uh, we saw the NFL do a miraculous job of uh, taking care of that this year so I don't think it should be an issue issue for the NHL to uh, kind of get around and uh, be able to make sure their games are happening but yeah the boys are they're they're happy to be at camp it's obviously an honor anytime you're at the NHL main camp and then with opening day lineups coming out soon I'm really excited to see if anybody can crack those and then if not just uh, stay patient on the taxi squad and be ready for uh, for when they get their name called I'll kind of put you on the spot one more time here and then we'll give our, our predictions on the season but um, let's say you get named to the taxi squad of an NHL team Okay. You, you can't play AHL games if you're on the taxi squad. Like the point of it is that they, they can't send you down. You're, you're always there. Would, would you rather play the season in the AHL and get games in or be up there in the NHL season and potentially just play one or two games or who knows, maybe even zero. If there's, if there's a couple people ahead of you there, like, is it bad for your development? If you're one of those guys, interesting thoughts there, there's two ways to go about it. If you're a young guy, you want to get in games, you want to get your professional experience. But if I'm a 32 year old man supporting a family, I'll take the NHL pay all yeah, day, 100. Sure. So we got to think about both sides of the uh, both sides of the equation there for sure. Because it, there's a lot more money if you're on the taxi squad. I'm pretty sure they make NHL though. I, I wouldn't see why not if they're forcing them to stay with the NHL team all year. Um, Actually, but- I I don't know this, but I might have heard that they don't. If really, I. I I probably should look this up, but I'm, I'm going to say this isn't fact checked, but I, I've heard that uh, if they're on their entry level, that they don't. And, okay, and you got to think most of them are there. A lot of these guys are going to be the entry level guys. Yeah, a lot of them are the entry level guys, but yeah, I don't know. But, it, and, it, and I don't know if I'm right there. So listeners take that kind of with a grain of salt. But <laughs> yeah. So disregard our comments. They're taking how you want them, but uh, that, that, that's pretty much it. it. It's obviously great to play, but also practicing against show guys every day isn't too bad either. Unless you're getting bag skated every morning on a game. Like, <laughs> literally these guys are probably getting bagged every day, but yeah, um, no, it's, I, it's, I went through it. I went through it in SAG my first year, like just yeah. getting absolutely, we had uh, our coach Darren Rumble there. He Philadelphia flyers. Um, amazing guy. Love the guy. And uh, he, we called it the rumble rinse because he would just absolutely Oh man, it was tough. Every morning we'd go into the rink and it was me and Danny Caddick there and then a, a few others. So uh, I don't know, but it, it was tough for sure. And every day is just like kind of dreading going to the rink, but he made it fun. Yeah, it's definitely uh it's, it's good experience, you know, being part of that taxi squad, especially as a young guy when you're, you're right there on the fringe. But 
I, mean, I just got I just got word breaking news from JT in the living room. It's AHL money. They're making AHL money on the taxi squad. I, I thought so. That's that's horrible. <laughs> so yeah, that's a tough situation. I'd honestly probably, as a young guy, rather go to the A and uh, be able to develop my game and get used to playing against bigger, stronger men. Yeah, that's so interesting, but definitely, uh, definitely a unique situation. So that that kind of does suck if you're getting your AHL pay and you're not even you know, you're bagging every day. You're not playing. So that, that's an interesting one. We'll, we'll keep an eye on that. And hopefully they're mixing up the lineups, maybe get these guys some games in there. And um, you know what, there, there is going to be injuries. There is going to be people getting COVID. So they'll, they'll get in, I think. But anyway, let's talk about our predictions, early prediction cards. Who's winning the cup this year? Yeah, I know we want to send it over to Delhi here soon, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and say the Colorado Avalanche. They just got such a uh, great young crop of players there. And with Kale McCarr on the back end, and their decor just goes on and on too. I mean, we watched Paul and Byram. He's a Colorado Avalanche prospect, and he's spectacular at the World Juniors there. And then uh, up front, how can you uh, not like Nathan McKinnon, one of the best players in the NHL, most powerful for sure. So that's my pick. How about you? I was going to say Colorado and now I'm kind of thinking about something else. I don't want to just say the same thing as you. Um, I think I'll, I'll say this. I don't think it's going to be Tampa. A lot of people are kind of picking them. I, I think uh, they're kind of going to have the Stanley cup hangover that you've seen before where, where teams, you know, you, you win it and then you spend the summer partying. You probably spend the first half of your season partying and it's just, uh, I, I don't think they're going to win, although they are a fantastic team. So maybe they'll prove me wrong, but yeah, no, I got to stick with what I was going to say. I think Colorado as well. Um, you know, you you summed it up well. And just seeing them in the playoffs last year and getting that experience and taking it forward, I think they're hungrier than probably most teams in the NHL right now. So I, I can definitely see Colorado winning. Absolutely. All right, and we'll send it over to Ty Delandria. But before we do, I just want to mention that support for the Showbound podcast is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Big news, Manscaped just launched in Canada. And for those listeners in Canada, you can be one of the first Canadians to experience their life-changing products. Manscaped sent me and Cardi, uh, you know, a little bit of a care package and we've been using it. It's definitely been really cool and, and you know, no more nicks, no more cuts anywhere on your body. So it's definitely, definitely a good product that I love. And, and that's why Manscaped has redesigned the electric trimmer. The Manscaped engineering team perfected the greatest ball hair trimmer ever created and have their new and improved lawnmower 3.0. Their third generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents. When I tell you this is premium, I mean premium. The battery will last up to 90 minutes so you can take a longer shave. The waterproof technology allows you to groom in the shower. And one of the coolest features is the LED light, which illuminates grooming areas for closer, more precise trimming. They've also upgraded to a 7,000 RPM motor with quiet stroke technology. And let's not forget about the charging stand. Show your mower off loud and proud because this intelligently designed stand is a convenient charging dock powered by USB. If you're listening to me speak right now, I want you to experience it firsthand for yourself. Trim that junk of yours. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code SHOWBOUND at manscaped.com. Your balls will thank you. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code SHOWBOUND at manscaped.com. It's time to shave those balls, eh? And let's send it over to Ty Delandria. All right. Welcome to the pod, Deli. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, boys. For those who don't know, Ty Delandry is currently at Dallas Stars camp, and uh, they've had a little COVID pause, uh, as a few other teams in the NHL have already. So, Deli, can you just tell us what's going on and, and what you guys are doing now to stay safe? Yeah, we're uh, kind of in lockdown now, and I know you guys, well, you back in Ontario, um, you kind of locked down. But, yeah, we're kind of – we had to quarantine on the way in, and we're quarantining again until – we get going again so we don't know when that'll be but everybody's kind of in lockdown pretty quiet here um how many days on the ice did you have before this happened yeah we had the first three days of training camp and then we had a day off and kind of when the day off came they let us know that we were going to shut down for a bit okay uh can you just tell us about your training camp experience so far like how's that been for you obviously it's kind of a weird one and, and not a lot of people but um you know getting to be around the the team really right off the bat like how's that going yeah, yeah, it's been good. It's uh, it's been a lot more comfortable this year in training camp. Uh, you know, the past year's been coming in, and it's a little harder to get comfortable. But being in the bubble with all the guys last year, um, you know, it was really comfortable to come in, and you know, you just feel at home. And they're all good guys, so uh, I think this year it's going good. It's it was competitive for those three days. We had a good scrimmage before it ended, so yeah, I think I think things are going pretty well. 
And yeah, you mentioned the NHL bubble. Like we we've had a few bubble guys on, and we like to talk to them about their experiences there. Like, uh, how was your time in the bubble? Obviously, it was a really long one for you. So, uh, like, how did you get through the days, and and was it a struggle for you? Yeah, it was long for sure. Um, it was a long time, but it was good. Like, uh, you know, it kind of went in, in in different phases. Like, you're in the first and second round, and um, and you're watching the games, and you kind of as each round went on, you're more and more excited to see how the guys were doing and, and follow them along. So uh, it was long, but like we had a good group of uh, aces and we had a ton of fun. So um, a lot of good memories from there. Did you see any like interesting encounters or anything that, that like the list, the common listener would find pretty funny or unique? Uh, I, I don't know about any funny encounters, like more just, you know, funny times with, uh, with our team, but uh, yeah, just a lot of like elevator rides, you know what I mean? Like elevator rides with, uh, Ben Bishop was kind of he was hurt the whole time so he was hanging out with us uh, a lot and we come back from practice and you're riding an elevator and he knows everybody like he's talking to Kucherov and talking to different guys and so it's just fun to you know ride the elevator with him and, and you know he's having conversations with them and whatnot it was a good time yeah that's pretty sick obviously yeah getting to be around those guys and get some experience under your belt for uh the years to come obviously going to be a uh, key piece in Dallas's franchise going forward and speaking about franchises, um, obviously you were a huge part in uh, building up Flint um, going into that year. Kind of the team was in jeopardy a little bit. Um, kind of things were going a bit sideways and stuff. And you, you got drafted fifth overall to uh, the Flint Firebirds. And ever since then, their organization has really turned around. And they had a great team this year with uh, you leading the way as captain. So can you kind of just take us through like what, what kind of transpired over those four years that you were there? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Like looking back, I remember uh, getting a call like before the OHL draft from uh, Joe Birch and just saying like they wanted to make sure someone would come. Right. So uh, they had a couple of years the year before the draft pick didn't come. So, uh, you know, they want to make sure it's common. He's like, yeah, you know, we're, we're thinking of drafting you. Would you come to Flint and like kind of being in shock? You know what I mean? Because I knew Oshawa picked uh, pick six and that was, that's like my hometown. So, mm-hmm. um but yeah, I just kind of like talked over with the family and decided like, yeah, like let's go do this. And um, so it was fun. Like looking back, it's crazy how far it came from being there the first year. Um, we had a couple of bad years and then turned it around and uh, just like the whole process of going through junior hockey and like growing up over the four years and making friendships and, and all it's, uh, it's such a good time. So it's super crazy looking back. Yeah. And with, uh, with that being said, even though you're on a weaker team, your first few years, you, uh, you had a standout draft year and really moved yourself up the board, uh, as the season progressed, uh, can you kind of just take us through how your draft year went and then how the draft went with the draft being in Dallas and, uh, being selected by the Dallas stars in the first round? Yeah. Yeah. So the start of my draft year, like I wasn't really ranked high or anything. And, uh, so we had, uh, we actually had an all right year my first year. So going into my second year, we had a, a couple older OAs. And I remember there being like, a, you know, a bit of a OA spot challenge just with, with how many of the older guys we had. And so we, we kind of struggled off the start. And then I remember uh, Ryan Moore and Nick Mano, who are two best players, got traded to Hamilton. And so they were, they, they were sharing the sea at the time and just kind of our leaders and whatnot, and like our go-to guys in all situations. And then, um, when they left, there was kind of, you know, there's, there's Maurizio Colella was our other away, but, but there was no real, you know, everybody was looking for another guy to kind of like do it or like take over, you know what I mean? So you always have to have your guys that are kind of pulling their weight. So I remember a few games after the left, it was hard and it was my draft year and we were struggling and, and I just kind of felt this like situation where I was like, somebody's got to, you know, step up and, and take over, you know what I mean? So, um, kind of had a different mindset and that's kind of how the draft year goes. And then from there just rolled on and, and um, you know, I had a good line going with Connor Roberts and Coella and we just kind of, you know, tried to do what we can with that team and take over and, and be leaders of that squad. So yeah, I ended up just trying to, you know, play, play as I could. And I knew I could every game and I kind of climbed, climbed up the rankings as the season went on. And then it was round draft and uh, I didn't really know where I was going to go. Like a lot of things were saying, late first, mid first kind of thing. And so um, we were in Dallas and uh, I remember just watching like Jamie Ben and Mike Medano do the, do the whole draft thing. And I remember thinking in my head and it's kind of funny or you're thinking like, you know, whoever 
you get drafted, like, is this pick is, is going to be pretty cool. Cause in Dallas and just like, you're thinking that and I had no clue. Like I had no clue that it was, that it was going to be me or whatever. And then um, Jamie kind of stuttered like Flint. He like kind of screwed it up and I was like, what the heck? And so <laughs> it happened and uh, yeah, it was just a sweet night and uh, yeah, just a lot of fun. Uh, I want to know, did you have a lot of like contact with Dallas? Did you kind of have a feeling like you could be that pick? No, that's, that's the weird thing about the draft is like, uh, we, we had the combine and I, like all of my interviews went well. Like they, you know, they asked a lot of questions. I, most of them, I came out of thinking like, okay, like, you know, that was a pretty good interview. And I remember Dallas is being like, so short. One that stood out was like, so short and to the point, like it was a good interview, but I was like, okay, like maybe like they picked 13 or whatever. Like they, I wasn't really on the radar, but it was just like, so short to the point, probably my shortest one. And then I was out of there. I was like, well, like there goes that one kind of thing. So, but yeah, it's, it's funny how you look back and like, I would not have expected it going by interviews or even like, you know how you do like the talks throughout the year, like the phone calls that uh, like online, you know, uh, questionnaires. Yeah. Like, yeah, I never would have thought. Yeah, that's crazy. Short, but sweet. But uh, I guess it paid off obviously uh, in a huge way for you. And it's pretty cool that you had Jamie Ben call your name up to the stage there. Uh, and that just kind of leads me uh, throughout your career here. We're going to just keep it rolling. And uh, the World Juniors, you were a key piece in Canada's uh, gold, medal, gold medal victory. Uh, not not a lot this year, but uh, last year. And uh, you were an A cap there. So what, what was that experience like and being able to take uh, home gold for your country? Yeah, that, that whole experience was unreal. And um, like from start to finish, we had such a good group of guys. And um you know, spent training camp in Vienna, you know, touring around and, and practicing every day and then went to the tournament. And uh, yeah, the, the whole thing was unreal. Had a lot of family there, which was cool. And from everything from, you know, having a tight one with USA to start it off and, uh, you know, a little adversity, like so much happened. Like uh, I think Footer got suspended. Hayden got hurt. Lafreniere got hurt. Um, Bowen, Byram and... Uh, yeah, a couple sick guys like in the semis, like really sick and they couldn't play. And so it's just, it was just kind of like a mess and it all pieced together in the end. And, you know, and oh, and losing to Russia, six nothing, the big one. But um, yeah, <laughs> it, it all, it all pieced together in the end. It was just made it all sweeter. And I think we'll all remember that. So it was awesome. Yeah. And that also um, for, for the listeners, I believe, Del, you were the guy who you, you shot it out of play, but it hit, it, it hit the camera, right? That was you. No, no, that was that was Dudas in the final, but I shot it out of play in game one versus USA and, and uh, Bear, Andre Tierney, uh, the head coach of Canada's team this year, was our assistant. He, like, caught it over the glass like this oh, yeah. from getting a, an over-the-boards penalty. Yeah, uh, there was, there was a that. bunch of controversy around that, and, like, people were saying, oh, my God, he, like, best catch of the tournament. But, yeah, no, Murr just told me that, uh, that you shot both. So a little bit of misinformation from him, but that's all right. I'll let Rask take it from here. Yeah, I remember that play. That was funny. I mean, there was MLB teams tweeting at Andre Turnier there, like <laughs> just saying they want to sign him and stuff. That, that was sick. But um, is, is there like a standout, other than obviously winning the gold medal, but is there a standout memory from the World Juniors um, that you, maybe it's like off the ice, something funny that happened, but like other than winning gold, what was like a very memorable thing for you from that tournament? Uh, Vienna was pretty cool. See, uh, a funny moment actually from that tournament was, we won um, and we had to fly back the next morning. So we were, you know, out with our family that night and celebrating. It was a good time. And then like, no one really slept the whole bus ride. We went all the way through the night. Um, I don't know where we flew out of. So we're all gassed and like after it kind of wore down, like the celebrations a bit and everyone was tired. We were in the airport exhausted and uh, we were at our gate and back when we, you could fly and there's a bunch of people in the airport and whatnot. Um, there's a ton of people in this one section and and I was walking with Bowen Byram and he had like uh, the trophy or whatever. And all of a sudden he just starts holding it up and screaming, like, <laughs> like celebrating and screaming. And I have a video of it, but he's like yelling throughout the whole thing and people start clapping and cheering and just like in the middle of the airport, like it's dead silent and he goes off. It's hilarious. That's it's unreal. unreal. <laughs> might, might need to get that video. Hey, eh, Cardi, you might maybe post that. Yeah, that could um, be a clip for the boys for sure. <laughs> that, that's a solid one. Um, so I want to I want to talk about uh, your AHL experience in Texas there. And um, you already mentioned Nick Camano, a teammate of yours in Flint, and uh, now in the Dallas Stars organization as well. Uh, 
first of all, how was your experience in the AHL and like did having a, you know, a very familiar face help out when you were there? Yeah, big time. Yeah. Having him there, like we were, we lived together in Flint. So um, like we were good buddies and then to be able to go there and like, he was having me over for, for dinner at his apartment, uh, just like, made you feel like one of the boys quick because you're coming up from junior and you know you're there's a lot of HL guys a lot of older guys so showed me the ropes and yeah that experience was good like getting a taste of pro hockey um before you know I went back for another another year junior and um just just to see you know how competitive it is and how different it is um you know how seriously they take you know the job pretty much and just um you know how competitive it is so it was it was eye-opening for me going into that summer and and you know realizing okay like you know I gotta work for this a lot and then uh you went and started this season in Finland so your second taste of pro I guess what was the what was the league like there the lifestyle like uh, where were you living there too by the way what city I was in Juvascula um it was about yeah <laughs> I wouldn't know it's a mouthful. Yeah, I, I couldn't say it for until I probably got back here afterwards but uh <laughs> Yeah, it was like three and a half hours north of Helsinki. Um, yeah, Finland's beautiful and, and the lifestyle, like it was like middle of winter. It's just different. In middle of winter, everybody's like riding their bikes, you know, to work or to home. Like it's just they're really active and, uh, you know, it's a cool place. Like it's uh, it's really like busy. Like people are always out doing something, walking, biking, um, whatever. Um, but yeah, the the hockey was great. Like it was a, a fun league. It was a hard league. Um just a lot of different things. Like you have bigger ice, but you know, it's a more defensive league. Like I was no, I had no clue. Like anybody did like a five back four check, you know what I mean? And just kind of sit oh, yeah. there and wait for like, you're so not used to that in North America. We're used to like running gun and two on ones and three on twos. And like, I was there, um, you know, four weeks and I probably saw like one breakaway, you know what I mean? Like, it's just like different hockey. It's a lot, it's a lot of defense and, centerman was like a third defenseman so it took a while to get used to it but it was good yeah and when you when you came back did you have to soak a two-week quarantine or you get exempt from that i had a seven day yeah so oh, that's that's not too bad so you just not hung like out. A yeah hung out that's like a yeah it could be a lot worse and uh from there we'll kind of just take her into some fan questions here i know we got some stuff after but we'll uh we'll throw some in now for the uh viewers here um so you got any special pre-game meals to eat before every game uh nothing too specific um I feel like I eat pretty early like I don't um you know like some guys eat two or four like I try to eat around like one and just have a little snack maybe oatmeal at the rink or something like that so um I like to play on an empty stomach but other than that not a not a ton of specifics for the pre-game meal yeah and then that leads me into any rituals or superstitions or like what's what's your day in the life during a game day you go what take us through that yeah just uh i don't think anything out of the ordinary you know go to the rink um morning skate uh you know i don't like it to be too long so just kind of feel feel the pocket and get the legs moving a bit and then um come off sometimes i would pull tub sometimes i wouldn't on a game day which i guess is a bit bit different and then um just go home uh, back in junior, my roommate Jack Bibbs would uh, cook the meals. So we'd have a meal, early meal, watch some TV, and then we'd uh, have a nap and wake up, grab a coffee on the way to the rink. Um, we would, we would, uh, I live with my two best buddies in Flint. So whoever, if we like won a game, like a home game or away game, because we'd go for coffee on the road too, but whoever, bought the coffee that day, however long the streak was, he would just keep it going. So <laughs> I'm buying coffee. And I remember, I don't know who it was. It wasn't me. It was either uh, Busby or, or Fibs, but we went on like a, I think a 16 game heater this year and there's a lot of copies bought. So it was. <laughs> yeah. I remember that actually. Cause like you guys were breaking records left and right there and uh, people were going nuts in Flint. And uh, so, yeah, I sure uh, his debit card uh, wasn't thanking him too much for you guys uh, hot streak there. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then next we got a question actually. It says, uh, what's, what's your best goal ever, ever scored in the, in the OHL or higher really? Uh, my best goal ever might've been against, uh, Blake there with you. Uh, I think we were, it was my second year we were home in Flint and, uh, I was kind of coming down the right. We were playing Sudbury and I was kind of coming down the right. I think it was shorthanded and I, uh, 
went to kind of like put it through a stick on the one side and I kind of fell and the puck was like still there around the guy. So I got around the guy, but he kind of like need me or trip me. And it was kind of like, it wasn't as nice as that OV goal where he's like on his back and he uses like the blade of his stick. But um, I remember like I was kind of falling down and I was like on, on the ground. I just kind of swung the back of my stick and, and got around him. So um, yeah, I think, I think that would have to be it. All right. <laughs> okay, yeah. That, that, that seems pretty legit. And then I got one here. Um, that says, what does it feel like to have one of the most legendary fights in the OHL? And I don't know, it's not referred to, but I, I'm going to go off my top of my head and say it was against Ian Washker up there. And, uh, I think it was in Mississauga, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was, that was, that was a fun one. Um, I just remember like, uh, he kind of, I hit him in the corner and he kind of, uh, just kind of like came right after me and jumped me and, and he was a bit smaller than I was. So like, I think I was like, I wasn't like, I didn't really know he was like a fight. Uh, he, he was a tough kid. Like I didn't know he was, yeah. he, was a, he was a fighter or anything like that. And um, we kind of got going and, and yeah, it was, it was crazy. Like just, we weren't really protecting ourselves and we were just going at it for like, I don't know how long it was, but I remember. Um, and those are, those are the cool ones too. Like we, we both knew when it was done, like we were both like beat up and, and we we're both you know bleeding or whatever. And we just kind of look at each other in the box and you kind of like just give each other the eyes. Like we both knew like, okay, that was a sick fight. You know what I mean? It was, yeah. it was a good, and then like, I didn't know him at all. And uh, I think he like reached out on Instagram after and he was like, good, great fighter or not. Like that's, it's kind of cool. And you can like, like whatever you're playing the game in the moment, but you, you know, and you can look at each other and just respect, like that was a sweet fight. It was, it was a good time. Yeah. And he, he's nails. Like he, he can throw punches and obviously you're no pushover too. I saw you at a sick tilt, like against, like you were playing, like I was playing for SAG at the time. And uh, I think you might've taken a run at fats. Um, and you guys are obviously like your boys, like we all skate together in the summer and stuff. And then uh, you take a little run at him and then Kinger kind of jumped in and you guys had a sick tilt there, just throwing bombs uh, at the, uh, at the door there. And I've never heard a crowd so loud for a fight. Yeah, the, the door, the Flint fans love their fight. The funny thing about that, uh, that fight too, is like, um, I remember World Junior Camp was coming up and like, obviously we both knew, like I knew Fetz was going to be there, whatever. And uh, I remember that happened. And like, I I'm, I was kind of playing, like I was always like line matching against Fetz or like the other team's best player, you know what I mean? I was playing them hard, but like, I'm not really, like I don't try to play dirty or not. I think I caught him with a knee or something. And we weren't like, like boys at that time. Like I didn't, I didn't know him that well up until probably world junior camp. And uh, I remember, I think Fibs and my buddy again was like watching out. Now you're gonna have to room with them at, at training camp at world juniors. And so I get to my room. I think he was there first and uh, like, cause he was pretty, he was kind of mad after I ran him. He, you know, said something to me. Um, and then he like texted one of my buddies, you know, saying like, what was, what was Deli doing? But I, I show up at camp and, and I go up to my room and sure enough, it's Fets. And but we, we hit it off from there and, and, you know, we're good buddies now. So. Yeah. That, that's classic, man. And I remember like he was losing it on the bench. Like Fets isn't used to getting ran like that. And then uh, you take a good run and he's like, what's Deli doing, man? Like we're both local guys. Like, I don't know why he's doing this to me. Like, come on. But yeah. um, no, this, this um, kind of leads me into the next one, I guess. Um, you've gotten in a few fights, I guess they weren't because of chirping, but we heard from Jake Durham today. I, I made a uh, special phone call um, to probably the biggest agitator in the OHL. So first, before I ask the question, what was it like playing with Jake Durham, probably the biggest agitator in the OHL last year, always in the middle of things? It's, it's, it's hilarious. Like you, I think, you know, like I don't, I don't chirp and I don't uh, like, I, I'll get chirped, whatever. And, and I don't really like, I'm more the kind of the quiet guy. Like I'll just go about my game and just play and, you know, um, but I played with Jake, like we played on a line so much throughout the Flint years. And he's like the biggest agitator in the OHL. And, you know, everyone hates him if you play against him. But like, I'm sure once you get to meet him, he's like your best buddy. Like everybody loves him. Um, and so I would get chirped or he would get chirped. But the best thing about playing with him is, is someone would chirp me. And I remember multiple times specifically. Um, and I would get chirped and he would do everything for me. Like he would just chirp him back and he knows everyone's stats. He knows everyone's, you know, secrets almost. So he would just start every, anytime I got chirped, he would 
literally st- speak up for me and just chirp on the other side of the bench or chirp on the ice uh, like for me. So it was pretty incredible. So yeah, he's a, forever. So he's, it's a good guy. Yeah, man. He's an absolute motor mouth out there. And obviously like I knew him a little bit going into the Owen stuff, but like the guys on my team were in the locker room before that first game, Sag versus Flint when I was like 16, I'm pretty sure. And they're all like, man, like I'm going to take a run at Durham tonight. Like I hate that guy. And like, everyone's just freaking out how much they hate Durham chirping him about being ginger and stuff like that all the time. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it's pretty funny, but uh, no, he's a good lad once you uh, get to know him for sure. And that, that leads me into another thing he, uh, he brought up here um, when I was on FaceTime with him today, he wanted me to uh, tell, uh, tell the listeners kind of, about the, about the time you sewered him into jumping off the roof of a church building. <laughs> Oh, this is this is an incredible story. <laughs> so, so my mom works at a at a church uh, back home where we're where we're from in Oxford, and so, like I I've grown up. We were in the same like three four split um, class like growing up. So I've grown up with them forever. And so say, or sorry five six doesn't matter. We were in the same class, and I think we were hanging out one weekend or whatever. And we my mom had to go to the church, so we went up to the church we're playing like floor hockey whatever like i'm like let's go up on the roof like i don't know we're just like kids just being a nuisance so we went up on the roof and just kind of like was playing around on the roof like it was a pretty tall building so like climbed up you know whatever a couple stories up and we got down to this one part and i don't remember how we got up but i was like oh there's a shed here we'll just take like a a four foot hop on the shed and we'll we'll get down from there so we're on the roof of this building and jake's always been like a bit a bit bigger of a dude but like not not huge (laughs) you know what i mean and and so like um i was like okay i'll go first so i jump off the building and land on the shed (laughs) and and it was fine and i jumped off the roof and then then jake goes and, and he jumps off the roof of the church and goes right through the shed no. and like felt like a tractor in the shed breaks the top of the shed. <laughs> <laughs> That's too good. So he's he's in the and and you know Jake like he's all, he's always chirping and yelling and whatnot. So he goes, I watch the whole thing. He's on the roof of the church and jumps through, goes right through the top of the shed and lands on like a lawnmower in the, in the bottom of the shed. And he, he would have been losing it on you after, I'm sure. Oh, losing it. We were like, I don't know, 12 years old. He was losing it and mad. There was losing it. All right. I'll, I think that does it for our fan questions. Rask, uh, you want to keep it rolling here? Yeah. I mean, I got a couple, couple more uh, kind of questions for me and some fan questions. That, that story is unreal though. I mean, it's actually kind of lucky that he landed on a tractor. I guess he could have broken some bones or something maybe, but um, that's unreal. Yeah. Um, one of the fan questions was, is there anybody you model your game after? And maybe a follow up from me kind of, is there anyone on Dallas specifically you're, you're trying to learn from or, or do kind of what they do? Uh, yeah, I grown up, like I remember um, in junior and like going into your OHL draft year, like that question comes up so much, you know what I mean? And uh, I always used to answer with Jonathan Taves. Just like I love, I loved him ever since, you know, that whole world junior shootout stuff and following his career. Um, I feel like I kind of play like him a bit, like, you know, obviously he's crazy talented, but just a two way centerman and, and he's playing in every position and he's like super reliable, but also can play, you know, play with one of the best wingers in the league and, and be super successful. So someone I tried to model my game after. And then um, here, um, like, I mean, you have, like you have Sagan and Pavelski or two, you know, Pavs is one of the best, you know, centerman in the game over the, the past however many years, right? So um, just watching him and his habits and um, both of our, our great right-handed centermen. Um, so it's, you know, just watching how they how they carry themselves and, you know, how they, you know, try to better their game each day. You can learn a lot from them. And uh, I know, Cards, you mentioned you guys train or some something together, skate maybe in the summers. What's your summer training schedule like in a, like, I guess in a normal year? Yeah. Yeah. So I train at uh workout at twist and whippy and we got a good group of guys there. So, um, it's fun working out with them. And, uh, you know, we, we work out at eight till 10 and, and then, um, some days we'll go skate with Kornacki with cards and these guys. And some days we're, uh, doing power skating with, uh, Ashley Jones and at the, uh, in Oshawa. So, 
um yeah we got a good skate going there a card so it's a fun one and a lot of good guys yeah yeah the boys the boys have a lot of fun there for sure and uh we get we always get a we always get a little scrimmage going at the end to uh corny's in the box keeping score so the boys get a little bit dialed in a little fun and then uh, a lot of chirps out there for sure yeah i got a i got like one more card and i'll throw it to you if you have anything um okay. i kind of want to know like obviously you know you were high picking the ohl high picking the nhl were you always kind of on that upper tier growing up and like at what point did you realize you know i can make a career out of hockey like, I, I can play in the nhl when did you think that this could seriously happen yeah i think like, I think some that a lot of people don't know is like, I wasn't very good growing up. Like I was, you know, maybe like I had a couple of good years, like major Adam, minor Pee Wee. I remember being a couple of good years, but I remember like minor Bantam and, and major Bantam and even going into my draft year, like, you know, I wasn't playing in those big summer tournaments and I wasn't like, you know, they, they, they start projecting, you know, so early for the OHL. I wasn't on any of those or like a, a highly touted player um, growing up. So yeah, I, I, there's a lot of things like the summers I, I spent at the cottage with my family and we were, you know, I was into like dirt biking and wakeboarding and wake surfing and um, just like being outside. So like, I, I thought, honestly, I thought I would do something like that. Like I always loved like that kind of like that more, like action sport kind of thing, if you know what I'm saying. So uh, I did a lot of that growing up and I always wanted to like, I don't know, race snowmobiles like my older cousin or like race dirt bikes. And that was kind of what caught my eye growing up. And then it wasn't until I didn't start like actually training um, or like not, not spend a summer at the cottage until going into my OHL draft year. So that's when I started working out with uh, Evan Cardsy, which, which, yeah. You know, and so had a summer there and like just once I started working out and going into my OHL draft year like I wasn't even like ranked or anything and at all and I remember like just kind of grinding and, and you know like starting to focus a bit more and like realize like okay like I guess there's this OHL draft coming up I should probably you know get going so um ended up having a, a good year in my minor midget year and then same thing like kind of went through the same process you know like I, I went high in the OHL draft and worked my way up and then kind of started out my NHL draft year kind of at the bottom and worked my way up too so um it's kind of been cool like you know I've always um you know worked hard and worked for it but uh you know, a lot of these guys come out and they're like studs from when they're like six years old, you know what I mean? So I kind of took a little bit of a different path. Yeah. And that, uh, touching on just like kind of being under the radar and stuff, like a lot of guys leave their teams, uh, at a younger age. And this is a good thing for the, uh, for the younger listeners to, uh, listen to, or, or even parents of, uh, kids growing up through hockey. And I think it's really important. Like you were a guy who stayed in Cal, you played for the central Ontario Wolves the whole way up. I'm pretty sure. Right. And like, um, so for you, like, obviously you're a great player and everyone kind of knows you in the ETA and stuff. You probably could have made a move to a bigger, a bigger town in Whitby or Clarington where the teams might've been better, but you stuck with your guns and you stayed in uh, central Ontario the whole time and it ended up benefiting, benefiting. And it, it's something that a lot of people don't understand that, uh, you can really do. And it, it does pay off. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. And I'll always, you know, um, kind of tell that side of the story, like, I remember everybody leaving and, and a lot of good, like even good guys like that. I, you know, really enjoyed playing with, uh, leaving, going to different teams. Like a lot of guys were going like Clarington to York Simcoe doing the St. Andrews thing or going to the G and stuff like that. And I remember people reaching out and we're like, like we, we were a struggling team as cow as it is. And, and, you know, these are the guys I've played with since minor Peewee and it's like, just being loyal to, you know, where you grew up and I'll always be loyal to, you know, poor Perry and where I grew up and, you know, they've had a, you know, created me to who I am today. So just sticking, sticking with my, my boys that I grew up with and, and, you know, playing for them, playing for, you know, those small town kids that, you know, want to make it, make it somewhere one day. So for sure. Yeah. I think that that's pretty cool for a lot of uh, young listeners to hear and just understand that it, it isn't always the big centers that produce these stars and, uh, but yeah, um, I think th that does it for questions for me, actually. But I have one more thing. I know me and Deli have a, uh, a good friend in common, and he's a uh, big fan of the pod. He's been telling me to get Deli on a lot, and it's Rutsy. So uh, 
Just want to give us a, a little uh, talk about Ratsy. Just give him a little shout out. Obviously, you know Ratsy pretty well. He's a great guy, and uh, he was assistant coach with you there in Flint. Yeah, yeah. Shout out Ratsy. Uh, yeah, he was assistant coach in Flint, and uh, man, he's a beauty. He was uh, the best. Like he would his he would thrive. He would just come in in the morning, and we would always, you know, like kind of typical junior hockey. You'd come in the morning and have your, you know, still your clothes on. You just go sit in the lounge and chill out, have a coffee or whatnot. You'd always come in guns and blazing in the morning talking about what, what nonsense he was up to last night or whatnot. So he was, he's a good guy. He's a great, great dude. Yeah. He's, he's always up to something. And uh, he, it's, it's almost like he's one of the boys. It's not even like he's a coach. It's just like, he's a player on the team. He's just in the locker room. Uh, roughing it up, messing up with the boys. So, uh, yeah, he's a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, a little shout out to Ratsy on the pod here, but, uh, Ras, you got anything more here? Well, I just want to say that, uh, for you coming on, we're going to be sending you an Axel watch. I, I got mine cards. He's got his, his watch yeah. that everyone in Sweden thinks is, is for the Swedish flag there, but, <laughs> yeah. um, we'll have you take a look at the website and we'll send you one. And for our listeners who want the Axel watches, uh, you can check them out and use the Showbound 15 promo code. That's Showbound 15 for 15% off. But uh, yeah, you're going to be rocking an Axel watch heading into some Dallas Stars games this season. And uh, I think it'll look good on you. So um, that that's pretty much all I got. Yeah, you got anything, Cards? Yeah, I just got one more thing. Obviously, you guys were, uh, you're going to be looking great going into the first game here in Dallas with a new watch on. But uh, this is other than that uh what, what what kind of happened like you guys have the the covid outbreak a little bit so when when is your game pushed back to just do you want to tell listeners obviously everyone's starting kind of i think wednesday right we we actually haven't heard um you know they they came out with uh like our first you know we they basically came out and said we won't be starting on time or whatever but they haven't you know we haven't we don't know a date or at least players don't know a date so um we're still still in quarantine. Hopefully, we'll find out in the next couple of days. We'll start skating again, and then uh, find out when when we start playing. But yeah, I, I couldn't tell you actually, to be honest. Okay, cool. And uh, yeah, for me, that pretty much does it. Uh, so yeah, really appreciate you coming on, and uh, best of the luck here going forward in uh, in Dallas's camp. And uh, let's hope you crack the lineup here. For sure. Thanks, boys. Thanks for having me. All right, what a great interview. I want to thank Ty Delandria for coming on. Definitely, uh, really cool hearing him speak and. Uh, he had some funny stories and and uh, definitely an interesting one. What do you think of that? Yeah, man, Delhi's a great guy, like I said before, and uh, really cool to have him on. Cool catch up with him. I haven't talked to him in probably like a month or two ever since he went to Finland. So good to catch up with him, see how he's doing. But yeah, definitely some great insight. And I think a lot of funny stories that the listeners hopefully really enjoyed. And we can get into the Bachelor segment. I know uh, it's difficult for Cardi to watch it, but I'll, I'll kind of keep it short. Uh, I, I watched her today. I watched it just before oh, we recorded. Yeah, I watched it, man. But no, I'm just I'm just gonna go ahead and say like Victoria's gotta go. Yeah, listen to this. So I'll have a controversial opinion. I obviously I can't stand Victoria. I absolutely can't stand her. And it seems like the whole show is about her and, and Matt's not even getting any attention compared to her. But I I'm I think she came into this with a plan to be the most obnoxious person and she's gonna earn herself her own reality show. I think I think she's putting on an act just to become famous off this. And I bet you some TV person out there is going to be like, this girl is going to, is worthy of a show. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I, I don't know about a uh, big broadcasting station or whatnot, but, <laughs> uh, she, but uh, I mean, definitely could be a possibility, but man, like she's just dragging on, she's ruining the show. We were, the boys were debating, just turning it off today. We were just, I was like, no, we got to battle through. Just keep watching because I got to talk about it on the pod. But for me, that pretty much sums up the episode. Terrible episode, but a little bit of uh, hype up because we got a to be continued. So we got the rose ceremony next, but I saw in the teaser, she's there next week anyway. So like, it's a joke. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things where, you know, the producers are saying like, look, this girl is, is getting so much attention. We got to keep her on the show, that type of thing. Yeah, exactly. And he's probably hating it because she, oh, yeah. he's just going in for makeouts and stuff. It's like, come on. <laughs> she she sucks, man. Like, but I'll tell you, she adds the entertainment value and like she pisses everyone off, but that's that's what they need in the show. So I can I can appreciate it, but I do I do very much dislike her. I'll say that. But um yeah, the the ending of the show was kind of interesting with with that girl sort of passing out in the rose ceremony. Like, I don't know what happened there. And she already had a rose. So it was weird, but 
hopefully she's all right. I'm sure she is, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see how the, the, the next episode goes, but uh, that, that just about wraps it up for this week. Is there anything else you want to say, Carzy? No, just uh, shout out to our fans for continuing to give us endless support. And we really appreciate everything you guys do for us. So uh, we're going to continue to create good content and uh, we can hope that you guys can continue to uh, keep watching it. So really thank you. And uh, we'll see you guys next week.